Good morning interweb, welcome back to Will Arse, the show where I review and or showcase your creations. First up we have Petra Katzman who submits the origin myth of Vecina. So this was quite long so I'm not going to read it out unfortunately otherwise we'll be here all day. I'll leave a link in all the usual places for people to go check it out. It's well worth it. Two things I really like about it, I love the diegetic world building as usual and I really like the idea of the sun being the severed hand of the god and how you know god gives rise to life and the sun gives rise to life so the two are metaphorically aligned here. I really like it. Well played everyone, go check it out, links in all the usual places. Next up we have Lazar Markovic who submits a magic system. In my world the five war gods, fire, water, earth, air, lightning, gave all the races slash sentient species magic and everyone has it. To use this magic you need an object called a catalyst and this could be anything from a pen to a house. These can be anything as long as they have the magic writing rooms script. What is written in these languages changes how magic reacts when flowing into the catalyst. The people who make or inscribe these catalysts are considered scholars and artists. So this is a cool start to a magic system. However, the critique I would have here would be one of limitations. I think it's always prudent if you are designing a magic system to think in terms of limitations. So for example, did the gods give an unlimited or limited supply of magic? Seeing as the magic came from multiple gods, are there different forms of the magic? And if so, are they all equally accessible or are some variants rarer than others? In terms of the catalyst, can anyone make a catalyst? Like if you just need any object and you need to write something on it, what's preventing a layman from writing on it and creating their own magic or their own means of doing magic? And I suppose finally, what is used to write the script? Is that material plentiful? Is it magical? Could that be a limitation perhaps? I would consider answering those questions and thinking of other questions like this, because as it stands, it kind of seems like a very unlimited magic system. Everyone has magic and everyone can do it freely, which I guess is fine, but I think it's more interesting when we enforce roadblocks or constraints on our potential fictional magical users. Just something to think about. Cool start. Next up we have Asterios who submits a piece on dreamstones. In a long night world, a militia turned authoritarian technocracy, the guard, rules the land with an iron fist, but their authority is questioned when they can no longer disclose a progressively more frequent series of strange meteorobio-psychic phenomenon reflections centered around surface deposits of common gem, dreamstones, affecting citizens all over the dominion. Folkloric evidence suggests dreamstones held spiritual significance for ancestral populations, but present inhabitants are unsure why. Now, reflections seem to enrich the material into a bioreactive variant, live dreamstone. Being in its vicinity during a reflection storm brings about seizure-inducing optical and oral hallucinations, as concentrated energy blasts send shards flying. Shrapnel injured survivors are said to develop psychic powers, such as telepathic communication. Superstition and propaganda means reflection survivors are stigmatized and often ostracized by their local communities. While the guard denies the very existence of this phenomena, it actually monitors occurrences and gradually restricts access to sites to further investigate. As they struggle to keep such activities under wraps, the general public grows restless and various insurgent groups form, among them a cult-like organization led by reflection survivors, the Reflectors. The Guard has secretly weaponized live Dreamstone. Their technicians have built it into artifacts, dream crackers, that harness the psychic energy of the bearer, amplified by extreme emotions and available when asleep dream energy, capable of unleashing city leveling pulse attacks. But the experimental top secret technology proved unreliable and was shelved. When a prototype tester unwittingly goes rogue, bringing one of the last surviving dream crackers into an outpost hamlet covertly controlled by a rebel group, the power balance shifts and all out civil war may be ready to break out. I really like this idea of like sleep related magic system type thing. It's really cool. You mentioned in your email that you are actively drawing on dream research. Some of your characters are named after dream researchers, IRL dream researchers, and various locations have something got to do with dreaming. 
Rem, Cusp, Woken, that kind of thing. I think that's really dope. I really like that. I like the idea of the ancestors perhaps knowing more about this phenomenon than the current inhabitants of your world do. I think that's really cool. This makes the setting and the world feel really big and lived in. And it reminds me a little bit of The Fifth Season, a book I recently read. Great book, possibly the best book. But in it anyways, there's these things called obelisks and they're like these like mega structures that float in the sky. And the characters in the story don't really understand them. They were put there by a previous civilization. I really enjoy the idea that ancestors were more knowledgeable or technologically advanced and the current people lack that knowledge. I think that's really rich. The idea of the shrapnel giving people magical powers I think is really good and a good example of a limitation. In order to gain this magical power you have to go through bodily harm. It's not something that everyone will want to do. So not everyone wields this dream related magic. That's cool. I thought you can go a little bit further with it though. Like this shrapnel, perhaps it radically shortens the lifespan of the magic users. Again, another limitation, but also it could play into the propaganda of the guard. I can imagine some, you know, state sanctioned propaganda saying that all of these infected people are ungodly and the devil inside them is destroying them and they're dying young, etc. I think that could add a layer of richness on top of it, maybe, if I were to suggest something. But overall, yeah, dope. Really enjoyed it. Next up, we have SD Schultz, who submits some nominal morphology. In the KMU language, there are prepositional plural markers used for nouns. Singular nouns use no markers. Dual nouns use ta. Pichi, one tree. Ta pichi, two trees. Plural markers for more than two of a noun vary based on if the speaker knows the exact number or not. Ka is used with exact numbers. Se is used with unknown numbers. Mila ka pichi, five trees. Se pichi, some trees. In informal speech, the preposition se is doubled to indicate many versus few. Se pichi, some trees. Se se pichi, many trees. In formal speech, however, the speakers use Tose and te chu to indicate many or few. Tose se pichi, many trees. Te chu se pichi, few trees. Cool, so you said that you enjoy the sound of this language spoken. Based on this sample, I would agree. I think it has a very nice phone aesthetic to it. You also say that it could be fixed to be brought closer to a natlang. And to a degree, I agree with this too. Although some of the weird decisions you've made, I think they're very easily justifiable. Like for example, your plural marking strategy. The notion of specifically marking whether or not a speaker knows the exact number of what they're talking about is a little strange. I can think of a lot of examples that do the opposite. They specifically mark to show approximations. That said, I could totally see the system arising really naturally. Like perhaps very often speakers back in the long, long ago would have said things like those five trees or these five trees or the five trees. Perhaps those type of utterances got used so frequently that the expected behavior is that whenever you have a numeral, a demonstrative must show up. And then that demonstrative over time becomes reanalyzed as a sort of definiteness plural marker, which is what you got here. That pathway feels naturalistic to me, so yeah, I think what you got is cool. Finally, we have Lan Lang Ling with their myth of the sun. When the world was yet young, the gods created the sun so that they may live in it. And the great god said, how will we move to new pastures with the sun in one place? And the gods called upon all there was so that they may solve this. The blue charioteer and his blue horse strapped the sun to their chariot and pulled it across the sky. And the great god said to them, the home of the gods is too heavy for you. And all the gods said to them, stop lest you perish. The blue charioteer and his blue horse wanted to themselves the glory of pulling the sun. So they perished after one day. The other charioteers saw what happened. And so they said, the red charioteer and her red horse hailing from the east shall take the sun from the horizon to the quarter point. And the yellow charioteer and his yellow horse hailing from the north shall take the sun from the quarter point to the zenith. And the white charioteer and his white horse hailing from the south shall take the sun from the zenith to the three quarters point. And the black charioteer and her black horse hailing from the west shall take the sun from the three quarters point to the horizon. And at night the same shall occur. And so the four charioteers and their four horses hold the sun to this day and do not perish. And the gods prosper because of their work. Again, just another really great entry. Really enjoy this. 
I like the kind of religious text style writing you got going on, very dope. I like how the myth explains the movement of the sun through the sky. There's a sort of moral implication of hubris there and you, one should not be hubristic, like the blue charioteer. Very cool. It explains why the sky is blue. That's the body of the dead blue charioteer and his blue horse. And also you mentioned that it explains why there are no blue horses in your world. So the only thing I would add here is that I think I would like to see more said about the night and the moon. Maybe the red and yellow charioteers do the pulling throughout the day and the black and white charioteers, very nighttime colors, do the pulling throughout the night. And I think having something like that might reinforce the sort of mutual cooperation theme that you've got going. So even though the red and the yellow charioteer are not present during the night, they trust their work is not in vain and the black and white charioteers will do their job. I think that might help strengthen the narrative a little bit. No, not that it needs strengthening, it's just adding a little bit to it. Also, you could frame the night as being an act of mourning on the part of the charioteers. The black and the white charioteer are mourning and remembering the blue char the fallen blue charioteer. And again, I think that could help build the complexity of this sort of moral myth you got going on here, in that even those who are hubristic or do silly things or like bad people, they're still people and they still have redeemable qualities to some degree. So perhaps we should remember them and celebrate them, or at least remember and celebrate their good points. And from there, you can just go off in all directions, like maybe remembrance religious services are only ever held at nighttime for reasons to do with the myth, etc., etc. Just some thoughts, but like even without any edits, this is great. So well played to you and well played to everyone who submitted some great submissions this month. Love it. Anyways, that was that. Woolerst done. Massive thanks to you for watching. Massive thanks to everyone who submitted. Links in the description if you want to submit for future Woolerst episodes. And a massive thanks goes out to all the patrons. In particular, Lycan, Johan Spadker, Oliver Reed, Spencer Brownlee, Alexander Roper, Andrew Pisha Hale, John Huyer, Rip the Passe, and World Anvil. Until next time, Ed Grouch.